Good morning, Stockholm. It's, uh, uh, it's great to be back um, after a year, and um, I'm super happy to see you all after yesterday. So what we're going to do, Jochen and I, in the next uh, 25 minutes is to talk a little bit about autonomous networks. Not autonomous networks in the sense of the theoretical conversation which we had yesterday. We're going to bring it down to earth, and that means we're going to do three things. So we're going to first show you a couple of things in terms of where we see the industry, and you are more than welcome to participate and tell us where you see yourself. Secondly, we are going to go into the environment where we're going to show what we see next, and then we're going to show a short video which is uh, releasing basically something which we're going to release officially at Cisco Live uh, in the US in two weeks. So if you want to see more, feel free to join us there. And we're going to take this the next steps. Now, looking into, looking into autonomous networks, I'm usually comparing autonomous networks with autonomous cars. This is something which um, we, everyone is talking about for the last 20 years. How many autonomous cars do you see on the streets these days? I would see rather little. There are prototypes all over the place, but you don't really see autonomous cars in productions. But what you've seen throughout the last 20 years is upraising of assistance systems all across. So if you buy a modern car right now, you have lane assistant, you have um, distance control, you have speed control, you have uh, sleep control, and so on and so forth for the drivers. And that makes the life so much easier and so much better and so much more relaxed to get to from point A to point B. On the long run, you would love to get into your car and say, hey, I don't know where I am right now, but please get me to Paris. And the next stop is going to be getting off in Paris and being in the real environment where you want to be. Ideally, you'd love to have the same environment in the IT industry. So if you do a comparison of autonomous cars, and a comparison of the IT infrastructure environment where we are all working in, it's a very similar thing. Javier yesterday did a great presentation where he introduced the different levels of TM Forum from one to five. And uh, I would like um, to ask all of you right now after this um, to enter a Slido poll to tell us a little bit about where do you see yourself. But uh, looking into this, everyone wants to be in autonomous networks level five. This is something which is um, probably something we are not going to achieve throughout the next couple of years, but we will get very, very close. So from things which have been taking a long time, which are very cumbersome, which are repeatable, which you need to do again and again and again, you are going to be able to get to an environment where all of these things you can offload to machines, you can offload um, to an automation environment, you can offload to an AI system, which we're going to show a little later, and um, you will get much, much closer throughout the years. Some people say um, it's a human challenge. I would say it's a human opportunity. And the most important thing is uh, everyone needs to keep in mind that you are able to delegate tasks to machines, to automation, to AI, but you are not able to, to transfer um, responsibility and accountability. You are ultimately going to stay accountable for all of what the machines are going to do. Now, let's look into the Slido. Can you please bring up the Slido? So, we are interested in uh, what level of autonomy, autonomy do you currently have in your networking environment? So, um, feel free to be honest, right? We are not recording who says what, but uh, it's, it's very interesting to see because the industry is debating right now where you are. Some people are, are still in uh, text-based Excel environments and transfer things. Some other people have already uh, visibility on different environments, uh, but uh, I have so far no one seen who says I'm in a, in a full autonomous environment. Now, how many results do we have? 16 people. I think there are many more in the audience who can log in. What we see is uh, level one, okay, that's very, very basic. Level three is already ambitious, I would say. And uh, this is, whoops, sorry. Here we go. Level three, data model driven services. That makes a lot of sense. NSO is clearly helping in that environment. Digitized delivery or service as code is, uh, is another opportunity to help with that. 
but we are seeing rather few people in level four. So whomever voted for level four, I would love to have a conversation after this presentation to talk about this. Thank you very much. So the majority of people are at level three. Um, the next one, we had another poll, is where do you want to be in three years from now? So what is your ambition? What is your ambition to be in your networking environment? And uh, that's six people and everyone says you want to be at level four or level five. That's great, because this is exactly where we think we should uh, take the environment all together. And that is exactly level three. Okay, no one wants to be in the basic level, level zero to level two. And uh, yeah, it's another 19, 20, 20 responses. And basically everyone wants to be, or the majority want to be at level four and level five. We are all on a journey, right? This is something where we are more than happy to, uh, to be together on and explore these things. And uh, I'm pretty sure we have a chance to get to level four and level five um, along the way. Now, let's stop the slider here and go one step further. I'd love to talk a little bit about the baseline principle. So closed loop automation is something which is around since mechanical machines for hundreds hundreds of years, actually. And that usually basically means you are going to measure something. Based on this measurement, you're going to take a decision. And based on that decision, you're going to implement a response in an automatic fashion. That is something which is nothing new, right? This is exactly the same principle which Javier has shown um, yesterday as well. If you apply this to the IT environment, you basically talk about autonomous networks or AI ops in a digitized environment, you talk about observability and assurance to basically make things visible. You talk about decisions which are in the majority of environments these days are taken by machine learning, by rules, and in very few steps they are already taken by generative AI. This will increase along the way. And once you've created this visibility and you took the decisions, you need to have a way to implement those. And that is usually done via structural automation. So no scripting where you are basically putting all the credentials and all the different values into something which you need to reopen once requirements change. This is something you are doing with um, smart tooling, which you can fuel out of data model driven uh, environments and which you can reuse where you have a single source of truth, which is transparent to the tooling and you are able to use tools as they evolve along the way. Specifically in the world of AI, we see tools popping out of the environment like mushrooms. So the evolution is very, very fast and very aggressive, and it's important to have this flexible automation possibility. What we're going to talk about the next 20 minutes is how are you able to improve on all three layers, on all three levels, to get closer and closer to autonomous networks. Now. Let's look into the current mode of operations. In the current mode of operations, in many environments, you have a dependency in between the amount of people you have to solve the problems which are out there. And right now, specifically in a microservice environment, in virtualization with containers, virtual machines all over the place, you're going to get more and more different instances across the board. You're going to get more and more visibility. You're going to get more and more actions. And if you would scale this pure by humans, you are running out of resources and you're running out of time because it's really, really cumbersome. So looking into the possibility how to do this. I would love to welcome Jochen on stage. Please give a warm welcome to Jochen. Thank you. Jochen is going to help me. He is the expert who has all that conversations all day long. And Jochen is going to talk about the future things to make it a little more interesting in our presentation. Jochen, how are we going to do this tomorrow? Well, first of all, it's great to see that the majority of people here in the room are uh, in that uh, uh, section, in that uh, majority level beyond level three. That means your intentions are definitely not outpacing your abilities and you're not part of the left-hand side. And Michael already talks about the perfect storm, which our operators facing, right? So the economy, econo economics are really breaking, right? So we see uh, examples where we have uh, OPEX-CAPEX ratio from 5.1 or even higher. Um, 
and uh, by the same time, uh, introduction of complexity. And what comes with a factor of a human here, where you have that actually uh, your decisions depending on the humans, this is not an infinite resource, right? So we uh, see this um, erosion of, of talent, right? The exodus of talent. We see a lot of uh, retirements. So that is not a model that uh, scales forward, right? At the same time, you are pressured by hyperscalers if you are an operator, right? So they are dominating the digital service space and they are cannibalizing your business models. Um, and in order to compete, you need the best in class quality of experience. In order to have the best quality of experience, you need to have frictionless execution across all your layers. So business operation, service operation and resource operations. And in order to do this, you need to do much faster decisions, better decisions, more decisions. And the concept here is actually that you delegate tasks to machines, right? So that is this transition to level three where um, system operation is assisted by humans and where you actually compile your knowledge you have within the people and the company in software, which is an infinite resource. Great, Jochen. Now, the next thing we're going to do is to look through all of these different boxes. The first thing and the most important thing, if you want to go through a maze, is switching on the lights. So uh, if you want to run through this, um, uh, through this theater from left to right and you do this in the dark, the uh, likelihood that you're going to get bruises, that you're going to fall, that you're going to take a very long time is very high. And um, what we see is there are lots of possibilities to switch on the lights in the environment. Let's talk about some of them. So starting wherever you want to start in that circle, I would start from the security space. With Splunk, you have the visibility, you have agents, you have the capability to make security incidents very visible, um, very visible at any point in time. You have the chance to look further from top to bottom through the stack with availability, with performance analysis, with application analysis to go from the application layer up to the bottom layer of the optics and have full stack observability top to bottom. You also have the uh, opportunity to get full visibility left to right. That means from where uh, your applications are running up to the home systems with things like Sam knows, who has a great home uh, agent which is running on the, on the home routers of people and which gives you the possibility to basically see the experience of an end user across the entire environment. So if you switch on the lights top to bottom and left to right, you have switched on the lights in your IT environment. That, makes, that means you are going to create the possibility to see things you haven't seen before. If you see these things, you have the possibility to do things about it, right? You cannot improve what you cannot see, so switching on the lights is the absolute baseline. And once you've done this, you have the possibility to go one step further. Now, let's look into, let's look into what we are going to do here. Jochen, how are you able to get know-how into AI? So you have now all collected this uh, breadth of data, right? And the question is here is how can you derive enough insights from that data in order to allow AI to do informed decision? Or in other words, how you get actually from data to information to knowledge um, to insights and then finally to wisdom, which is required when you do those kind of decisions. So click. So the first example is here is actually a story or analogy to the robotics industry. If you think of a robotic hand, right, um, and you want to, uh, the hand to grab something, right, you need to coordinate across multiple actions, joints and sensors in order to perform that action. And we have in the networking space, our first step was here, and it's actually something we have built for one of our customer, a knowledge graph database, which is nothing else than an action catalog. Right? And that action catalog can be queried for dependencies. Right? So that action catalog includes things like NSO packages, workflows, right? sensor data, assurance information. And you actually can explore via a natural language interface the dependencies between those, uh, those items, which helps you then in the decision process. Right? It's based on Neo4G. And the next evolution step would then be a concept which is also not new in industry, which has a lot of buzz right now, is around a network digital twin, which is nothing else than a replica of your real network where you try to emulate, 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 emulate uh, the behavior of your network. 
right? And that's actually a key enabler for higher level of the autonomy, right? If you think of level four, level five, full, this, full control of the machine, right? You need to de-risk those uh, decisions making within the network. And what you see here is actually a conceptual prototype where we have a comp computational model based on a uh, graph neutral network model uh, and uh, deep reinforcement learning, where we are investigating the possibilities for, let's say, a low hanging fruit starting use cases. But also, if you look at the standardization in IETF, if you look at uh, what's uh, uh, going on in the industry, uh, people are working on the standards already, so check out things like digital map, right? And we also are in conversations with customer where we do joint ideation of how to come up with such a digital twin concept. That's great, Jochen. That's super. Now, taking it one further, so we've switched on the lights. We got information into AI and into actionable environments. What would, a common, what would be the common questions, Jochen, from an operator? If you look into the standards, the first question is, what happened? That's always good to ask, right? What happened? The next important thing is to look into, why did it happen? As soon as you know what and why, it would be great to understand what's going to happen next, to predict what you need to do. And the last but most important thing is, what am I going to do about this? So Jochen, talk a little bit about uh, how, what are we going to do about things? So what you see here is a collection of use cases, which we call traditional AI or AI ML, right? Which is nothing new, right? It's mature since 2017, probably, probably. And I guess you have you uh, in your operator in your networks have already some of those use cases in one shape or the other implemented, right? So that goes from the left hand side for normal anomaly detection, where you, for instance, try to predict hardware failures, where you collect deep sensor data from the hardware, and you. Uh, detect anomalies which will indicate, hey, you need to trigger an RMA. That's also an example for uh, an open loop, right, where still a human is there to press the button to actually dispatch track rolls. A lot of interest in that use case because it has a high uh, potential of savings. Imagine you can dispatch technicians uh, to the field, not in the maintenance window, but uh, uh, proactively. The second one is around uh, traffic forecasting, so where you take historical data and you protect capacity needs in your network, right? So this is an example, we call it auto capacity management. We were actually uh, pre-provision hardware based on the user demand, which is in this case uh, BGP peering connections. The right hand side is also a typical use case here, which is the uh, simplification acceleration of root cause analysis. So taking here crosswork as an example, you might heard in other forums where we talk a lot about intent based service assurance. That's actually where we build an assurance graph from the intent, so up from the service to the very deep level of the uh, network infrastructure where we can correlate actually the service health to the network health. Right, which is uh, the ultimate goal actually to, uh, to protect quality of user experience. And here it's actually a closed loop system where we take those insights and then can trigger remediation within the context of a transport network. Oh, that's cool. That's knowledge driven operations, right? Switching on the lights, creating the insights out of the, out of the data you've got, you've got and um, taking actionable opportunities. But this is old stuff, Jochen. Should we talk about the new one? Anyone interested in that? All right. Don't Over call it old, right? There are still uh, people on level uh, zero to two, right, who might have not these kind of capabilities implemented. And I believe it's still the bread and butter and the starting point, right? Everybody talks about uh, a generative AI, but uh, what will happen in production will be that what you just seen previously. Yeah. That's very good. The analyst, pro uh, the analyst, analyst projection is that 80% of the decisions taken in the future are still going to be based on rule-based environments as well as uh, machine learning, which we are doing since a very long time. And only 20% will be based on generative AI. I would say 120% of the hype right now is about generative AI because it's a new, new baby on the block and uh, it's very interesting. Jochen, entering new terrain, how are we going to do this? So what you see here uh, uh, on the right hand side is actually uh, where we are generating uh, a topology uh, generatively from unstructured data uh, uh, and actually from event streams uh, where we are discovering device interdependencies, events interdependencies 
And the objective here is actually to reduce the uh, volume of actionable insights dramatically, right? So really getting, uh, getting rid of the noise and do this kind of intelligence correlation, which brings us down, we have seen examples, uh, the volume of incidents or the actionable incidents down to 60%. Uh, also unifies uh, the root cause analysis, and that would be actually the trigger now for further going on in the loop. So that's, free, that's also integrated then with a thing uh, we call the AI operations engine, right? Where we have, a, again, a natural interface where operator can query the systems for various reasons. So I give you three examples. One would be for training purposes. Imagine somebody who has never touched uh, an ACI controller, doesn't have that CLI knowledge. He's just querying actually the machine around, hey, show me what a tenant is, what's configured. And also for troubleshooting purposes again, right? So somebody push the configuration into the system, uh, push fails, and then you would like to understand the reasoning. The third thing is the acceleration of implementation, right? Where we are using actually now LLMs to populate the data model, which gives a massive reduction in the human effort, right? I think we are down to by 90% uh, concerning that, right? And you can easily trigger then the extension of, in this case, it's a, it's a data center fabric. And that goes then into a pipeline where you already have a kind of a digital twin, where you actually do a pre-check of your configuration via an Nexus dashboard insight, right, to do a semantic check before it actually goes into production. That's very cool. That basically means both of these things are available. And if you see the first time that you, are, you have an agent listening to log files, and after 72 log files, he is creating a topology for you, um, that was magic when I saw this first. As well, last year I talked about data model driven automation with service as code or digitized delivery. That is something which we are doing meanwhile with more than 50 customers globally, with the biggest ones in the world, but also with smaller ones, and it's all available. So none of this is futuristic beside the AI agent. But we're going to get back to that a little later. Jochen, that one looks pretty similar to you, doesn't he? Yeah, let's talk about the fancy stuff, right? So let's talk about what premier accounts and premier customers are actually asking us uh, uh, currently, right? And they do the next level of AI ops where they go much more in the proactive AI ops where they actually, when you remember the, the slide from Michael, we talks about uh, prescriptive uh, analytics, right? You would actually uh, to have visibility into what will happen and what you should do, right? And in order to do this, here again is the concept of a digital twin, so where you actually would like to predict the quality of change you apply into your network, right? So whatever you execute on the production network has to go through that digital twin to do kind of a what-if impact uh, analysis. And there are some interesting use cases associated to this. So the first one here is uh, uh, something around uh, sustainability, so um, the resource optimization of your network. That digital twin also gives you the possibility to uh, model your sustainability figures and to have an optimal pass through your network, or what we also call the green pass, right? which gives you then uh, Carbon traffic engineering is a bit of the marketing word, but uh, we call this also um, energy proportional networking capabilities. The one in the middle is also, again, a very appealing network in many service operators around mass scale infrastructure upgrades, right? Let's, see, let's say you have cell side routers, 10,000 cell side routers, and you want to find the best, best suitable upgrade pass within a certain time, time window, right? So that means, okay, what is the right approach, A or B? what routers should be upgraded first, which routers can be upgraded uh, simultaneously, right? So grouping those kind of devices, while always protecting the uh, end user quality of experience and no compromises on the SLO, right? So what we do here in the, in the right-hand side is also to look higher in the value stack where you actually take crowdsourced data into the equation what you do on your network, right? Again, to my example, to map actually quality uh, user experience to the network health. Right? So here you collect data from, for instance, we have a tool now, SAMNOS, right, where you can collect user disconnects and you tie it back into the process. Very cool. So should we all have a look into how this is going to look like? So what we're going to do now is uh, something which we haven't done. We haven't done this internally. We haven't done this externally yet. And we're going to show you a short video how all of these things are going to come together. Let's roll the video.
Great. So what have we seen? We've seen the possibility to basically switch on the lights, take that information, take it into a decision capability, use the insights out of that decision to drive the automation piece and bring it home with AI in a much faster fashion. And what we've seen yesterday, talking to AI agents to understand the configuration, that is possible today. Talking to AI agents to understand the configuration, but then also to draw conclusions, how are you going to update your data model to where you want to be, that's also possible right now. And even better, once you are seeing errors in the pipeline, once you see errors in the environment, you are able to go back to the agent and say, what's the problem with this error which I'm seeing? What should I do about this? And that is something which we've also cracked the nut. So if you are more interested in this, join us on uh, Cisco Live US. We're going to show more around the service as code sessions um, with Jesse Reed, and he is going to bring more details and more longer demos about the agent. We are going to bring this out, I guess, throughout uh, the rest of the year sometime, and it will be available for different architectures um, along the way. Now, looking into, looking into what we've talked about the entire environment, we are on a journey to AI ops and autonomous networks, and we can enhance right now all three different layers. We can better and switch on more lights to get more visibility. We can take better decisions along the way. And we are able to implement these decisions with structural automation, which is around since a long time. Will this journey ever end? I don't think so. This is a journey which is constantly evolving with the availability of technology was around, with the availability of challenges, which we are going to see to further race. And um, we are in a perfect storm environment. And it's super interesting to be part of uh, that journey all along. And I would love to close with one thing which uh, Tom Gruber said, that he's an inventor of Siri, and he, he used that, um, that picture, which resonated very well with me, um, in the closing session of Cisco Live in Amsterdam. He basically says, never leave chatbots unattended, right? Hallucination, you're not going to anytime soon 100% uh, put out of the picture. But what you're going to be able to is to use chatbots to create ideas much faster than you can do this, to ask for help out of all the things the AI knows. And the AI only knows the stuff wh which you have trained them for, right? And as better we train those, as better the decisions get. But again, back to the uh, square one, it's, uh, it's a human opportunity. It's not a human challenge. And it's helping us to do things much faster, which took a long time in the past. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. And Michael, you always have good stuff to show at these sessions. I always enjoy your, your, uh, your, your morning keynotes. So a uh, I mean, question occurs to me. We've seen, and we've seen this with, even just with automation. A lot of cool stuff, a lot of great technology. You, you guys touched on the, kind of the, the wheel and the technology side. What needs to happen in the people process? For, you know, for a customer to get comfortable to turn some of these things on, um, what kind of conversations are you having? What do you, how do you prepare operations? How do you prepare leadership to, to actually make the leap? Yeah, I think, and, and it's, it's a super relevant conversation, right? Because it ties very closely to how is my job going to change? Or is my job going to disappear? The reality is I think many jobs are going to change because of the capabilities which come around. Um, and some will disappear, but new ones will appear as well and preparing people, it's a combination out of subject matter expertise. That's the bottom layer for all of this. You cannot automate anything which you do not understand. And you cannot use, once you understand the baseline subject matter expertise, that's the know-how which most people have today. If you understand the software environment, that's a good step forward because it's all software driven. On top of that, if you are able to understand data science and how to structure data, because AI only works with structural data, right? If you if you put, and excuse my French, crap in, crap out, if, you, if your data is bad and you put the bad data into that environment, you're not going to get a good things out. The fourth pillar 
is learning about how AI and ML works. And it's very interesting to see these conversations. I love the presentation of Javier yesterday, who broke it into different pieces and who showed very nicely that AI is nothing new. What is new is large language models, which are making it much easier to interface um, with the AI. So educating on all four pillars and bringing all four pillars together, I think, is the key. And that goes across every level, right? This, this will help on the decision-making end, on the, on the top layer of companies. It will help to make decisions faster and better with better data. It helps on the managerial level. And it also helps on the bottom layer. So people and engineers shouldn't be scared of what's, what's coming. They should be embrace it because it gives them the opportunity to do things they haven't been able to do before because they repetitively did things out of the old world. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take your hand. There's still a clicker for me. Thanks, Ben. <laughs>